Some time ago, I read an article that listed some rather humorous questions that all began with the word, why? Uh, For instance, why is it that you can tell your child there are billions of stars and he'll believe you, but tell him the oven is hot and he has to touch it to believe it? Here's another question. Why do banks charge you for insufficient funds when they know you don't have any more money in your bank account? One more. If the store near you is continually lowering its prices as they advertise, why isn't everything over there free by now? (laughs) Well, not every question that begins with the word why can be fully understood or answered. And we've been sailing in some deep waters in our wisdom journey as we've encountered the doctrines of election and predestination. You know, I personally believe we'll never get beyond the tension of these two doctrines, man's free will and divine election. And that's because, beloved, we'll never get to the bottom of the ocean of God's sovereignty. Now, Paul began answering objections to God's sovereign role in our salvation here in Romans chapter 9, and so far he's reminded us that God doesn't have to do anything at all to condemn unbelieving mankind because mankind is already condemned. God doesn't predestine people to hell, by the way. Uh, Everyone is, is already heading there. Election is a positive doctrine. It, it's for believers only to understand or at least contemplate. Now, with that, Paul raises a question that begins with the word, why? Romans chapter 9, now here at verse 19. Why does he, that is God, still find fault? In other words, here's the question. If God hasn't chosen to grant someone the faith to believe, well, why does he hold that unbeliever accountable? Doesn't sound fair to me. And that's a, frankly, that's a great question. But instead of trying to help us understand the depth of God's sovereign actions, Paul simply informs us that God can act any way he wants. And in any way that God chooses to act, he's always righteous and he's always just. So Paul's answer uh, really is a threefold rebuke. And the first rebuke is here in verse 20, where Paul writes this, Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? In other words, the pride and rebellion in our hearts, the autonomy of our independent thinking, you know, it's revealed by our suggestion back in verse 19 that, that God is unjust. As one author put it, we want the final word, and we think we have the right to challenge God or command him. And Paul is saying here, are you really going to talk back to God? Have you forgotten that God will have the final word? Well, now here's the second part of Paul's rebuke. He he delivers an analogy here in, in verse 20. He writes this, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? We could paraphrase this uh, to read, is the creature going to lecture the creator. And let me tell you, beloved, the unbelieving world doesn't believe they are accountable to God. They, they believe that God, if there is a God, would be accountable to them. But the opposite is true. In fact, Paul said back in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19 that, that God's law condemns everyone so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Let me tell you, God doesn't answer to you or me. We answer to God. In our last study, I mentioned Jonathan Edwards, the leading pastor of the Great Awakening in North America back in the 1700s. His uh, famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, is well known. He also preached another a sermon, not as well known, entitled, The Justice of God in the Damnation of Sinners. You're probably not going to see a sermon like that announced in the church bulletin. The first point in his sermon was this. If God should forever cast you off, it would be exactly agreeable to your treatment of him. In other words, the unbelieving world doesn't want God in their lives, and one day God is going to give them their wish. 
We tend to focus on the fact that they haven't accepted Christ and maybe they didn't have a chance. We, we tend to overlook the fact that they did not want him to begin with. Well, now thirdly, Paul essentially asks this question, who are you to direct the hand of the potter? He writes that here in verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? In other words, the potter has the authority and power over the clay. Does he talk it over with the clay? Does he ask the clay to direct his hands? Well, that would imply the authority would reside in the clay rather than in the potter. Now, the reason the average person today doesn't like Paul's analogy here is because we don't like to think of ourselves as clay, common clay. We're, we're better than that. We're, we're more intelligent than that. But this analogy reminds us of the huge difference between common clay and the divine potter. Now, here in verse 22, Paul asks his own question. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Again, what Paul is doing here is turning our thinking upside down. Even God's judgment one day will give the redeemed cause to give him glory, to worship him for his wisdom and righteousness. Uh, one day we're going to say, God is just and his justice is served. Now, here in verse 22, Paul describes uh, the vessels of, of wrath, unbelievers, in contrast to the vessels of mercy, which uh, refers to believers. Paul writes about these vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Now, don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean that God is preparing people for hell. In fact, the Greek text could be translated to read that these people are preparing themselves for destruction. Let me tell you, God doesn't make sinful people only to throw them into hell. God simply leaves them in their sin, which they willingly, they gladly choose to embrace. They would much rather have their sin than the Savior. And in so doing, what are they doing? They're preparing themselves for hell, for destruction, for judgment. Well, now Paul writes here at the end of verse 23 about vessels of mercy, which God has prepared beforehand for glory. And the original construction here changes so that the vessels of mercy are not preparing themselves for heaven. God is doing that. People don't need any help from God to go to hell. They can get there all by themselves. But those who are going to heaven can't get there without help, without the saving work of God. Now, let me say a, a closing word to the believer. Uh, you're one of those vessels of mercy by faith in Christ alone. I remember reading an author recalling his little childhood drama of always being chosen last for those little pickup neighborhood baseball games. He said, you know, the captains would be down to their last choices. Uh, they'd get a slow kid to play catcher or maybe, you know, somebody to stick out in the right field where nobody hit the ball. And he said, just once I would have liked to have had a captain choose me first and say something like, you know, you, you know, you, the, the skinny kid with the glasses, I want you on my team. <laughs> the truth is, he writes, I, I was never chosen with very much enthusiasm. Listen to Paul as he writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, beloved. That's another way of saying that God chose you with enthusiasm and early in fact, before the creation of the world. Again, this, this is a deep ocean of truth regarding the sovereign action, the sovereign decision of God. Jesus combines both of these, election and free will, 
He, he combines them together when he declares in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. That's divine election. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So the question that you need to answer today is not, why did God choose some to come to him and not choose everyone? Or why did God even create some people if he knew they would never choose to come to him? Those questions begin with the word why, and you're trying to understand God. And we're, we're not going to understand all that God does. Let me tell you, here's the real question. Have you come to Christ? That, that's the question you've got to answer. And you can understand that one. Have you come to him? And if you haven't, why not? What are you waiting for? I invite you to come to Christ today. Well, with that, we're out of time. Until we set sail again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.